I'm a British historian, and as such, I'm expected to use certain tools to find my evidence. I'm to go into the traditional institutions of a library or an archive. And yet, in all my years of researching, I have reflected that the best things I've ever found weren't in an archive or a library. And I think we need to reflect on our paradigm of where is the best place to find the next discovery, while our traditional institutions of learning may aid us in that pursuit. A lot of great finds are found outside of the archives. So I say get out of the library. There's a thrill in researching in non-traditional places. You ask me where did I find these wonderful discoveries if not inside a library? The best find of my life was in a cottage in rural England, in the countryside. You see, I visited several years ago a picturesque village called Sherborne, Gloucestershire. It's a tiny place. And I mentioned to an acquaintance my love for British history, and she said, oh, you must go down and meet the jewels. They're just a few doors down, and they love history. I think they got a lot of documents. His family, Mr. Jewell's family, they've lived in the village for many centuries. You've got to go, you've got to go. So I took the advice and put in a phone call to Mr. and Mrs. Jewell. And I said, uh, my name is Dr. Diane Lovell. Could I come and look at your documents? And I think they're a little skeptical of me, you know, being a Texan and saying, yes, ma'am, and y'all, and all that. But they, but they gave me a, a two-hour appointment. And on a beautiful June day, I walked down to their cottage and when I was knocking on their door, I had no idea my life would change forever. It would never be the same again. Inside, I met Jennifer and Eddie Jewell and their grandson, Byron Hadley. And they did have a vast collection of artifacts and documents and letters from the history, the long history of this village. And they were stored upstairs in a tiny bedroom under a bed and in a cupboard. And I was really overwhelmed. I didn't stay for two hours. I stayed for a month and a half. <laughs> Mrs. Jewell was so kind and she made me tea every day while I photographed a lot of their collection. One thing that really stood out in this vast collection, which I probably could work on the rest of my life, was a stash of documents. They were letters and I soon realized they're love letters. They're about 200 years old and they were written by a Mr. Bissett and they were addressed to a Lady Catherine Howard. I ask, who are these people? This isn't the local aristocratic family name, and ask locals, and nobody knew who they were. So I asked Mr. Jewell, I said, Mr. Jewell, where did these letters come from? Where did you find these particular letters? He said, oh, I plucked them out of the skip at the manor house in 1982. A skip is a dumpster. Now, Mr. Jewell was born in the village. He'd worked his whole adult life for Lord Sherborne and the estate. And Lord Sherborne died in 1982, and there were new owners of the manor house. And the new owners had the estate workers empty the vast attics out. This is a 60,000 square foot manor house. And he did. He dumped them in the skip, and then he thought better of it and plucked some of the things that didn't seem right to throw away. And he took these piles of history home to his wife, and she wasn't very impressed with them because uh, her cottage is very tidy. But I'm very glad she tolerated them. And 30 years later, I knocking on their door. This is what some of the letters look like. They often start off with, my dearest Catherine, and sometimes to save postage, they're written sideways. So they're very difficult to transcribe. So I took them home. I had digital copies of them. And I took the photographs home to my senior seminar. I was an associate professor at Houston Baptist University. And I had about 10 students in this class. Not all of them are pictured here. And this project changed their lives also. They often contact me about how great the days were when we were transcribing these letters. And we spent the semester just looking at a general outline of what is the story about? What do these letters have? What is the story here? And it was fascinating. And we felt that we were cutting through the fabric of time and peeking in and watching their daily lives, their most innermost thoughts in a city that didn't exist when the letters were written. And um, what we discovered is we've got a Regency era romance. That sounds like a Jane Austen novel, except this is real. 
this is real. They were written to Lady Catherine Howard. She's the only daughter of the Earl of Suffolk and Berkshire, and they live in Wiltshire. And he is Mr. Bissett. He's a reverend. He's a lowly born Irish clergyman who is a, a vicar of an abbey four miles from her home. Wow. These letters, I find these letters in the county of Gloucestershire, but the events occur in Wiltshire. And it took me a couple months to even figure out what they are doing in this county. How? Why? And it's because there were double marriages between the Earl of Suffolk's family, which is Lady Catherine's, and Lord Sherborne's family. Two marriages in the 19th century, so a relative had brought them to Sherborne House. It did not escape my notice that at the very time of these events of the actual romance, Jane Austen is alive and is writing and is publishing in the bordering county of Hampshire. And so, in summary, this is an epic story, much more than just a romance. It's a romance between the Reverend George Bissett and the Lady Catherine Howard, people of two different ranks and fortunes and status in society. And for about eight years, he cannot convince her to marry him. She clearly loves him. These are the most heart-wrenching letters you could imagine. She won't say no, but she never says yes. And eventually, in 1811, he says, I'm leaving the kingdom. This is your last chance. I have a brand new brother-in-law. He's just been appointed the governor of Ceylon, which is an island off the coast of India. And I'm going to go be his personal secretary, a missionary, a civil servant. And so he's there for nine years. And you know, after he leaves, she changes her mind. She writes him a letter. Now, it takes a year from when she writes it to get the reply. And he says, you know, you've changed your mind so many times, I I'm just not coming home. He was in Ceylon for arguably the most important part of the history of that island. Because while he was there, his brother-in-law, whom he lived with, General Brownrigg, conquered the last native kingdom. They take over the whole of Ceylon in a 40-day skirmish battles. And this is a very sad time for the native peoples. And George is there, but I didn't know if he was actually in the native kingdom ever. The British before this had just held the coastline. But he's there for about nine years. And then his brother-in-law is ordered home, and he comes with him. And he comes back, and her parents, the Earl and Countess, have just passed away, and they immediately marry. And they are married for eight years, and every day he's away from her, he writes her a letter. And these letters are packed with social history. Over 400 people are mentioned. There's thousands of historical details, all kinds of social history, ecclesiastical history, lots of Irish history in there. They're just fantastic. But I don't have time to tell you all about it. And he dies in t uh, 28, and she lives on a couple more decades and doesn't pass away until 1850. And so did I find any images of them? And I really was eager to find what they looked like, to humanize them, and I couldn't find them in the historical record. And so where did I find the portraits? Because I find quite a few. The first is I signed up for text alerts on an internet auction international website. I put in their names. If anything ever comes up for auction, text me. Nothing for two years, just junk. Then one day, there's an auction appears. It says, the Bissett family portraits are for sale. I didn't even know they existed. They're not in the historical record. And I got up in the middle of the night and watched an auction live in Glasgow, Scotland. And they sold the portraits of his brother, his great aunt, and his nephew. The men here are very prominent in the letters. I was thrilled. And, but no George. Probably not going to be an image of George. And the day I found the only image of George, I was certain I would find nothing on this day. You see, I was at Malmesbury Abbey. This is where he was vicar for over 30 years. I'd been there four times before. I'd talked to everyone I was supposed to talk to. I had photographed every grave. I had walked what I thought was every inch of the abbey. I was only there to show my research assistant the abbey so she could get a feel for what George's life was like. And we were leaving, we were walking out, and she needed to go to the loo, to the bathroom. So, okay, I follow her over, I'm leaning against the, we're in a tiny little hall, I'm leaning against waiting for the wall, tiny little place, thought, I've never been in this hall before. And I look up and there's this huge watercolor, a watercolor painting that says, the interior of Malmesbury Abbey, circa 1800. Billy, Billy, get out of the loo. I think we got an image of George here. And it may not be a beautiful oil portrait of him. 
but it humanizes him. And I was so thrilled to find him in his natural environment at the Abbey. And so the only image that was uh, in the historical record of Lady Catherine was for a wood engraving kind of poor quality. I really wanted to find what she looked like. So I went to the family. Now, her father was the Earl of Suffolk, and she grew up in this house, and the Earl of Suffolk still exists, and, and he grew up in this house too. And he still owns this house. And, and the current Earl pointed me towards his brother, the Honorable Morris Howard. And he has tragically just passed away. And on my first visit, he was able to show me something that was not then in the historical record. Her, her parents, her brother, and the only person in that nuclear family that's missing is her. No, Catherine. But on my third visit to Morris's house, in his own living room, I found the portrait of Lady Catherine. And I, it was in a cameo case. I said, Morris, Morris, can we look at this one? I think that could be her. And he pulled it out. It's about this big. It's tiny. And it's original by Hopner. And I was so thrilled. And he's let me photograph this. Another time I found an image of her in another unexpected place. I was volunteering with the National Trust. They had been given lots of artifacts and documents by Lord Sherborne, and they asked that I help identify, organize them, because I was trying to put an archive together. I took a photograph of it, hundreds of photographs that day, for research purposes, but I looked on the back. You couldn't read it. It was too faded, gone. I'll never know who the person is. A year and a half later, I was on my laptop flipping through. I thought, what if I just alter this a little bit? Could I read it? You know, it doesn't take much. And I could read it. It says Lady Cath Howard. Then it says Sherborne. And then it says Lady C. Bissett. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. I wasn't even looking for her. And then I bought another portrait of her on eBay. <laughs> and, the le and the letters, the Bissett love letters, describe George going to pick up this portrait from the miniaturist um, bone. Did I find any other documents or manuscripts about this story outside of the archive? Strangely enough, I did. One of the problems with this research project is that there's not much information about his life in Ceylon, modern-day Sri Lanka. They write letters, takes a year to get a reply, but they almost talk about love and why they're not getting married, or should they get married, but they don't talk about what he does in Ceylon very much. And so I noticed from archival and library research that George Bissett worked under a Honorable Thomas J. Twizzleton. Twizzleton, he worked under him every day in Ceylon. I thought, honorable? That probably means his dad's a baron, a lord in England. So let's go see if we can find the English family. And Twizzleton, who was the boss of Bissett. Twizzleton's family lives, and Twizzleton grew up in this house. It's Broughton Castle. And I went to see Lord Sayenseal. Now here's Lord Sayenseal and his heir. Lord Sayenseal was born in 1920. So I've talked to his heir, the Honorable Martin Fines, and asked him, do you have any documents from Ceylon or images or anything? He said, you know, funny thing, this castle has stood for hundreds of years. And last month we finished organizing all of our family documents. You wouldn't have anything from Ceylon, let's say like early 19th century. Ten minutes later I was sitting in his office looking at a stash of letters that Twizzleton had written from Ceylon to his family packed with Bissett information. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. So in my progress, I went then repeatedly to the uh, village where I found the documents. And I had a new acquaintance. Her name was Mrs. Margaret Shaw. And she had been in the village for decades. And she gave me a cup of tea. And I was leaving. And she said, Diane, I think you like history. I might have some letters you might be interested in. Letters? I love letters. And she said, they've been in this door for 30 years. My late husband, he was ordered to empty out the attics at Sherborne House, and he didn't feel comfortable. He never told anybody. <laughs> I'm like, no way. It's eight doors down from where I found the original, and the top letter was a Bissett love letter. And I got choked up, and I couldn't believe it, and I didn't know it was missing, and it's the best letter of all. And I call it the lost letter. And again, he is writing to his wife when he's away, and it mentions two other people that are in other of my research projects. And unbelievable. I couldn't find it. I couldn't believe it. Now, I then continue my archival work. I go to Northern Ireland, and I spend a week in the Public Record Office of Northern Ireland and find all kinds of great things about Bissett. But you know what? The best thing I found in the island of Ireland was not in a library but instead in a graveyard in, Northern, in the Republic of Ireland in Raffo. You see, George's brother 
becomes the Bishop of Raphoe, and this is the Bissett family plot. And so we go out there on a very hot day, and the gravestones look like they're unreadable because they're so old. But you know, if you uh, wait for the sun to hit it right, and you take them at different angles, you can see it. And you take it home and you edit it, you can see it. And if it's really blank, there's nothing there at all. If you take soil and you rub it in, letters start to pop out. We found people, especially young children, like 11 years old, that were not on the family trees, that had died tragically. And so then I said, I got to find out more and more information outside of the Western world about his life in Sri Lanka, in Ceylon, modern day Sri Lanka. And so in March, shortly before the tragic bombings, I spent a couple weeks in Sri Lanka. And I was determined to follow George's footsteps. You know, George had sailed in 1811 on a perilous ship journey by sail all the way down across the tip of South Africa and up to the, uh, almost to India, to this tropical island. And I was really determined to follow in his footsteps, but I decided to fly instead. And I spent a more than a week in the National Archives of Sri Lanka, often sitting next to a Buddhist monk in the reading room and found a lot of great stuff. But again, the best stuff I ever found there was not in the archives. It was on the day off, I went to the interior to Kandy, where I always wondered, did George ever go to the center of this island? Did he ever go? And I found in the temple complex there, across the way, a Christian church. I was at the Temple of the Tooth, the royal palace, which his brother-in-law had conquered, but I could not prove that George had ever been there. This is where the real history is. And in this vast temple complex, there's Buddhist temples here, there's a Christian church. And I found my answer, and my answer was in stone. It was written in stone. It says that George was the first chaplain of this church, starting in 1816. I immediately posted on Facebook. I was so excited, I was so excited. You know, in reflecting of my years, decades of researching, libraries are wonderful places. They're vast sources of, it seems like, infinite information. But I think there's a life lesson here. They can aid us in our research, but they may not be a great place for the discovery of the best things in life. So I urge you to get out of your traditional mindset, maybe get out of the library, and find great discoveries in non-traditional places. Thank you very much.